NTUC President, Ms. Diana Chia, NTUC Secretary General, Ms. Salim Suisei, brothers and sisters. Singapore has made much progress in recent years. We've enjoyed good growth, 14.5% in 2010, last year nearly 5%. Our unemployment is very low right now, just 2.1%, and for citizens, about 3%. We are getting good investment projects coming to Singapore, like the Rolls-Royce engine plant making their new Trent engines, and petrochemical projects and other good projects creating good jobs for Singaporeans. We are upgrading our environment, where there's Marina Bay looking new, where there's Pongol 21 Plus with a Pongol waterway. The living environment in Singapore gets better day by day, and above all, we have been able to achieve broad-based real wage increases for our workers. But while the overall conditions are good, I think workers are still anxious over various things. And last week, I had lunch with some union leaders to find out what was on the minds of their members and of themselves. So they told me item number one, cost of living, especially health care. They are worried that the CPF not enough, especially because of inflation. So. Two nights ago at the NTUC May Day dinner, DPM Taman explained what we are doing to manage inflation, stabilizing property prices, subsidizing health care, our you save schemes, all the measures we are taking to make sure that Singaporeans are able to take care of their families. And we will continue to do this and we will continue to monitor inflation very closely to see when something more needs to be done, we will be ready to act. Low-wage workers were another item prominent in the unionist minds. They were concerned that the wages of the low-wage workers were not keeping up with the rest. They were feeling that those earning low wages are stuck, no matter how hard they try to upgrade themselves. And that's something which affects us all, not just the low-wage workers. Thirdly, they are concerned with the ageing workforce. The older workers can see the competition coming, but they know that they need to retrain, but it's not so easy to retrain. And also, they're at the max of the pay scale. So unless the whole pay scale moves up, there's not enough upside for them to enjoy some fruits from their efforts, from their upgrading. All these are real issues that the tripartite partners must address together. And other, but other countries are also facing similar challenges, and their workers too. So I think while we look at our own problems, to see them in perspective, we should look at other countries, learn from them, and see what lessons we can draw. The SecGen just now mentioned a few briefly. I'll just take you through some of them again, because I think the lessons are worth thinking about. In Europe, many countries are in trouble. Why? because welfareism has failed. The idea that the government will provide everything has not worked. Workers have too little incentive to make the effort. Their jobs are protected, which means very hard to discipline the workers, very hard to let the workers go when conditions change, very hard to drop the workers when they are not putting in the effort. So the employers say, well, it was so hard to let the workers go, I better be very careful before I take the workers on. So the employers are reluctant to hire, fewer jobs are created. The population is aging. Their pensions are paid by the state. It's a very heavy burden on the state, becoming unaffordable. You take just one example. In Italy, the amount which Italy, the Italian government spends on pensions in one year is almost equal in terms of percentage GDP to the amount which the Singapore government spends in the budget every year for everything, education, healthcare, defence, housing, transport, all added together. Percentage GDP, about 15%, equals 15% of GDP on pensions in Italy. So you can't afford this. The countries have too much debt, investors no longer willing to lend them the money, and so they are in a crisis. 
the stagnation is going to last, unemployment is well above 10%. For young people, much worse. If you take Spain, 24% unemployment. One quarter of the adults are not working. And among the youth, 52% are not working. More than half. So you can imagine somebody who has no work, leaving school, and for 10 years he has no work. By the time he's 30, how does he start finding a job, looking for a job, learning how to be in a job, and starting his working career? So it's a crisis. People are very upset, upset with the world, upset with the government. So many governments have fallen. All along the southern Europe, they've changed governments. Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, all gone. Holland, recently, coalition collapsed. Romania, as I was writing this speech, I had to add into the list because the government fell down. France, last weekend, first round of elections. Mr. Sarkozy is trailing. Second round coming next weekend. He may lose. So, the continent is in crisis. In America, the situation is not so bad, but many concerns over social safety nets too. Health care, which we worry about, they worry about. Extremely expensive, expensive to the individual who must pay the insurance, expensive to the state who must pay out of the federal budget for Medicaid and, and Medicare. The social security system, which is pensions, also bankrupt but they can't reform it. Politically, it's impossible. So the budget is in chronic deficit, and they have no money left to invest in education, in infrastructure, in growth, in their people. If you look at the emerging economies, China, India, Vietnam, still growing, creating jobs, but they are not without their own worries and headaches. Like in China, worrying about income inequality, especially between the coastal cities, which are prosperous, and the inland areas, which are not doing so well. They are worried about economic restructuring because they know every year they have to do better, but they can't keep on doing better without changing the way the economy works. And they are also worried about an aging population and a shrinking workforce because not enough babies. And they worry that they may grow old before they grow rich. So, moral is, Every country has its own problems. Many of these problems are similar to us. It's inevitable because of globalization, because of technological progress affecting all of the world. We are not in an ideal position, certainly not perfect, but I think we should see our progress and our problems in perspective. On balance, I think we are in good shape to tackle the problems, but we must get our strategies right. And the first strategy we must have is to keep Singapore open and embrace the world. Open in a mindset. Be an outward-looking, confident society, willing to change, welcoming competition, willing to consider new ideas and to explore new opportunities. That's how we've become a successful and cosmopolitan city. That's how we've competed against bigger countries and held our own. That's how we can stay abreast of the changes improve our lives, and secure a bright future for our children here in Singapore. So when it comes to trade, we are prepared to do business with anybody. Trans-Pacific partnership with America, Australia, and so on, we join in. FTA with the EU, with all their problems, we still want to do business with them. Let's see how we can get a win-win relationship going. We open ourselves to the world, to business. We also welcome talent, an attitude which has served us well. I described just now in my Chinese speech how the Hong Kong TV channel, TVB, talked about our policies here and admired us for it. But I give you a more personal example of this. Many people come to Singapore to live, work, or play. They are impressed by Singapore. They go back home. They may rise. They are promoting Singapore as a friend, as a place where there's opportunity to prosper together. One such person is the New Zealand Prime Minister, Mr. John Key. He was here recently, visited us, but many of you don't know, he actually lived and worked in Singapore 
about 15 years ago, in the mid-1990s, for Merrill Lynch. His son was born here, and he remembers Singapore fondly, especially East Coast Park and the chili crabs and the pepper crabs, which he still goes back to visit every time he's here privately. Now, he's Prime Minister of New Zealand, pursuing more cooperation with Singapore, which will benefit us, whether it's in terms of our food, getting food from New Zealand, whether education opportunities in New Zealand, whether there's travel opportunities there. So an open attitude, I think, serves us well. And we need not just small numbers of top talent, but a wide range of foreign professionals and skilled workers. And this remains a hot issue for Singaporeans because they worry about overcrowding, about competition for themselves and their children, about different social norms, language, and so on. Yesterday, I posted an article on my Facebook page. It was about Germany facing this problem of foreign talent. They don't have enough workers. Their economy is prospering. They need engineers. They need IT people. They are importing some of them from southern Europe, where there are no jobs. And the professionals are going there. And in the long term, this is going to be a great help to Germany because it's going to strengthen their industry, strengthen their capabilities, build them up as an economic power even more. But in the long term, it's going to weaken the countries which lose this talent. And they're worried, the Spanish are worried, one day they may end up doing nothing except tourism and agriculture. But the Germans also face problems because the foreigners come in, different language, different culture. They can't fit in with the Germans. The Germans say hurls to one another, Mr. So-and-so, very formal in their engagements. The Southern Europeans are very informal in their engagements. So there's a clash and it grates. So I posted this to trigger some thought among Singaporeans that, hey, we're not alone in our problems. And it attracted hundreds of comments, many heartfelt and thoughtful ones from readers. People clearly seized with the issue, trying to see how we are different from Germany, what the problems we are facing in Singapore. So it's an issue, but it's a strategic issue for Singapore, which is important for us to get right. We will be debating the immigration and foreign worker issues during this year, so I cannot solve the problem today. But today, I'd just like to focus on one angle concerning the foreign workers, and that's the economic angle. And the way the employers look at this is different from the way the workers look at this. The employers, as Sri Se told you just now, their attitude is cannot find enough workers in Singapore, especially workers who will stay on the job. So better to bring in some foreign workers, seize the opportunities, rather than let the business go somewhere else. At least you keep the jobs, the business in Singapore, and you keep some jobs in Singapore. The workers see it often differently, that the foreign workers add to competition, competition with, against them, that if you have too many, it may reduce wages, and it may even take away some of the jobs which Singaporeans can do. So better we have fewer foreign workers and let our wages go up. If you asked me which to believe, I would say each argument, both arguments have their merits, but each one is only valid up to a point. You need a mix of local and foreign workers to man the companies. But if you set up a new company and only create jobs for foreigners, then you must ask, really, is this the best place for the company to come and invest in Singapore? What's the point? On the other hand, if you want the company to come and you insist that all the jobs are reserved for locals and you don't give them any foreigners and you don't have enough Singaporean workers or the right type, then I think the jobs will disappear. The IRs came to Singapore. We've created 30,000, 40,000 jobs in the two IRs, many of them for Singaporeans, but not all for Singaporeans. And if we had said, IRs come here, you just hire Singaporeans, I don't think you would have got the IRs. And I don't think those Singaporeans would have got the jobs, which have pushed up demand for hotel workers, which have enabled hotel wages to go up significantly. For many other hotels and F&B and outlets, 
and which has put the pressure on the hotels to upgrade and do the three-in-one like Matthew just now you saw on the screen doing. So the reality is we need a mix, companies need a mix, and we must strike the right balance. When I met the union leaders last week, they all told me, without exception, that they could not find enough workers. Every sector, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's electronics, whether it's F&B, whether it's services, all were looking for people. We are creating opportunities more than we have bodies to fill. Last year, we created 120,000 jobs, but there were only 32,000 Singaporeans to fill them, one in four. And our unemployment is already so low, and many of the rank and file workers already working overtime to meet demand. So we've had to top up with foreign workers to lower costs and to enable us to seize that opportunity when the business is good. Then the new companies can start. Then we can start creating new jobs, better jobs for Singaporeans. And then we can give the company a chance to build a Singapore core. One of the unionists asked me, how many foreign workers do we need? So I said, there's no magic numbers. It depends on the opportunities. In a good year, you want to allow it a few more to come in. In a slow year, we can tighten. We can let some of them go off. But it also depends on our own needs. If you want to build more HDB flats and MRT lines, you need more foreign workers. You want to have more hospitals and nursing homes, I think is unavoidable. You need some extra nurses, some extra allied health professionals, even some extra doctors from wherever you can find them who can serve us well. But in total, we have to slow the inflow of foreign workers significantly in the coming years because we just can't keep on bringing in 80,000 more foreign workers a year. There's just not space and it's not sustainable to keep on going up and up and up. So we have tightened up slowed down, not squeeze and reduce, but just slowed down the increase. And I think the company is already feeling the squeeze. It gives them the incentive to upgrade their productivity and also to develop a Singaporean core in their companies, people who will form the long-term skills, long-term loyalty, long-term capability for the companies and for Singapore. So. While we must always be open to the world, let me be quite clear. Singaporeans will always be our priority. This is the purpose of all our policies, including on foreign workers or talent. We are trying to seek the maximum advantage for Singapore and for Singaporeans. The second major strategy we need to succeed is to grow our economy sustainably and share the fruits of growth with all Singaporeans. Economic growth is still very important to us, not just for its own sake to have a number to display, but to provide jobs for each one of you to support your families, to bring up your children. Each one of the stories which Sui Se told you just now, without growth, they would not have happened. And growth is a result of each one of those stories adding together into one big collective story, the story of Singapore. How we create opportunities for Singaporeans to pursue their aspirations, how we get the resources to improve our lives and help those in, lead, in need. Growth is going to slow down because of our constraints. Not enough land, not enough labour. This is unavoidable but we actually need to work twice as smart to get growth through higher productivity. Because if you don't have space and you don't have productivity growth, you are going to have very little results, very little prosperity. We will lose vibrancy and drive and it will be disastrous for Singapore. So to get that, it means we have to restructure, restructure our industries, grow new industries, adding new value, and phase out the industries which are no longer viable. 
And we have to accept this turnover. Even when we are prospering, every quarter, a few thousand workers will, lose, will be retrenched, but many more jobs will be created. Take the electronics industry. From, we, use, we have been in electronics for a long time, but the type of electronics has changed over the years. We used to assemble basic electronic products, TV sets, VCRs, PCs. These are CRT TV tubes. You won't see them in the shops anymore. But if the older ones are here, please explain to the young ones what these things are. They are we used to make them low-end electronics. Over the last 20 years, we restructured to focus on semiconductors, the brains, the chips inside the machines. So now we produce high-end electronics. When you have a biometric passport, the chip inside the passport, 80% of those chips used around the world are made in Singapore, in factories like this one. It's a big transformation. Over two decades, we lost 37,000 jobs, but we created nearly 30,000 new jobs, higher skill, better pay. Productivity went up five times per worker. Contribution to GDP increased more than three times for the whole industry. Workers' wages also went up. How does this happen on the ground? It means we have to work company by company, worker by worker. The way Suisei described just now, one story by one story. And the companies have to take the lead, make productivity and skills upgrading a priority, work with the unions and workers, and share the gains with workers, because that's the right thing to do. It's a fair thing to do. The workers have to do their part too, to partner the companies, to upgrade, to learn new skills, to contribute their ideas to improve performance. Because as one of the unionists told me, the workers know this process. They know where something is not efficient and is wasteful. They know where you can save on some procedure and save time and save effort and do it better. And if you can engage the workers and get them enthused about it, it will make a big difference. So as uh, Brother Lim Kuang Beng told me from SISU, he says productivity improvements must be bottom up as well as top down. And that's what we should, we need workers to do in this effort. The company side and the workers, we hope they'll take full advantage of what the government is doing. Our restructuring grants for SMEs, our CET efforts, continuing education and training. We are building very beautiful new campuses for CET. This one is the CET Campus East at Paya Lebar Central. We are also building one at the West at Jurong Lake District. They are not to go on holiday. They are to go to, for hard work and upgrading. We've got the National Productivity and Continuing Education Council, the NPCEC, with roadmaps for different sectors, sectors like food services. Roadmaps, how do you specifically do things better in that industry? Food services, sharing part-time workers during peak periods, mobile ordering systems, using a PDA, so you don't have to shout the orders to the kitchen and scribble them down. Or precision engineering, also with roadmaps, with study awards, with master craftsmen to be trained. So we've got specific ways we can do this, tackle this, break it down, CBD can be done. i give you one more example to add to Three Say's many examples. Take Showa Denko. It's a hard disk drive manufacturing company. UE knows the company well. Last year, they merged two plants together to improve productivity and quality of their product. They upgraded their workers. They redeployed their workers. They expanded their job scope so the maintenance people covered more machines. The production personnel improved their product troubleshooting skills. And so their operating costs came down 10%. And their workers got higher salaries and bigger bonuses. So that is the way we do it, step by step. The third thing we must do is to translate growth 
to higher wages and better lives. Our ultimate aim is to improve lives for all of us, especially average Singaporeans, and especially those with the lower incomes. And over the last five years, in fact, incomes have gone up. Median incomes have gone up by 13%, even after you allow for inflation over the last five years, since 2006. And our goal is to keep real wages going up on average year by year. So we are tightening on the foreign workers, and I think this will help to push wages up. But to sustain the higher wages beyond the first push, not just for two or three years, but for 10 years and longer, then we need to do productivity, we need to upgrade skills. We've talked about 30% wage growth in a decade. That's a very ambitious target. And let me try and explain to you what 30% wage growth means. To get that, you must get the same productivity growth, at least, right? So you must get at least 30% productivity growth in 10 years, because then the employer will share some, the workers will share some. And if you look at it year by year and break it down, that means every year I need to make 2.7% productivity growth. 2.7% year by year, 10 years, compounded, I can make 30%. And then we can raise the workers' wages 30%. Doesn't look a very big number, but it's a very challenging target. 2.7%. How do we compare that? With Singapore, since 2000, last 12 years, what have we done? 1.7% per year. So 2.7% is almost one-third better. If you compare with developed countries, let's see what they have done. Most of them have done 1% to 2%. US, the best. UK, less. Japan, just 1%. So when we say we want to make 30% productivity increase, 30% wage growth in 10 years, we are talking about stretch targets for Singapore. Not easy to do, but I think we should set an ambitious goal and try our best to achieve it to the best of our ability and make sure that we make progress over the next 10 years. For the low-wage workers, we must make a special effort. So it's not just generally rising, raising everybody up, but focusing particularly on the low wage because they are the ones most affected by competition, by inflation, struggling to compete, and facing a predicament which many low-wage workers face all over the world. Unfortunately, there's no easy solution for this. Professor Lim chong Ya recently proposed pushing up low-wage worker wages quickly, 50% in three years, 15, 15, 20, bam, bam, bam. I appreciate his good intentions. I share his concern over this group of workers, but I do not agree with his drastic approach because the only realistic way to move is step by step with wages and productivity going up in tandem together as fast as we can, but as fast as is possible. In the early 1980s, we did have one period when we zoomed up and pushed wages up very rapidly, wage restructuring. But even then, we ran into problems. 1980s, 1979, 1980, Singapore was a developing economy. We were growing very rapidly, 8 10% per year. Our only competition was the little dragons, Korea, Hong Kong, Taiwan. China and India were not on the scene. And we actually had held down our wages because the NWC had been very cautious. We didn't want to, be, to price ourselves out. We held ourselves down as the economy went ahead. And so there was the possibility of us letting go and catching up, especially as MNCs like Philips, like HP, like Texas Instruments were coming in, creating thousands of jobs and making the labor market very, very tight. So we had room to raise the wages quite sharply, 
but even then, we overdid it. Wages shot up, productivity didn't improve, and we lost competitiveness. So in 1985, when the winds change, when the conditions turn difficult, we plunge into a very deep recession. It was scary. The older unionists will remember. In fact, you will never forget. We had to cut wages sharply. We had to cut CPF 15% so that the economy could recover. Today, <clears throat> we are in a different situation. The NWC doesn't dictate the wages. It's globalization, it's technology, it's competition, which is setting our wages. So the export companies are facing much tougher external competition, much more intense. Job by job, they compete against factories in China, in India, in Vietnam, everywhere. And as Francis Lim, Brother Francis Lim from UWE told me, they bid for every job, even against other factories in the same MNC. And if you are 5% out of line, the job goes somewhere else. And you don't get that order, you don't get that overtime. So the companies cannot easily afford a 5% cost increase unless they also get a corresponding productivity improvement. So that puts a constraint on the export industries. For the SMEs, they are going to be most affected when the wages go up because they employ many low-wage workers. Small company, not very profitable. Either if the costs go up like this, either the wages have to be passed on to their consumers, which means inflation for all of us, or the companies have to retrench their workers, may have to close. And they need time to upgrade their productivity which is why we are tightening the foreign worker policies only gradually to give them time to adjust and to help them to adjust so that it will be better for their workers. So we must do this gradually. If we do it too sharply, without corresponding improvement in productivity, we will make things worse. Low-wage workers will be worse off. I think the union leaders understand this, but they are under pressure because the proposal has been widely discussed. It has raised great expectations. And so it's important for me to spend some time today to explain to you why we have to move carefully, why a drastic approach will not work, why we should not confuse our workers. Better aim for what is sustainable. Don't take a big risk with short-term jumps in wages. But I promise you this, we will always do our best to uplift our low-wage workers. And we have many programs doing that. The Inclusive Growth Program, which Suisei mentioned just now, 100 million to upgrade 100,000 workers. NTUC and E2I taking the lead on this. We have major financial transfers. That means government money voted for low-wage workers and their families. GST vouchers, workfare especially for older workers, which can be 20% or more of their wages. Special employment credit to help, older, to help employers hire older workers and defray some of the costs so that they will hire more older workers. And over a lifetime, if you add up all this, one low-income household gets more than half a million dollars in government subsidies. The HDB housing grant, the education, health care, you save, all these workfare improvement and so on. So we are doing much. We are taking a prudent approach. It's an approach which, has, which is working. And over the last five years, real incomes of workers have gone up. In five years, they've gone up by 12% from 2006. And if you add in the grow and share package and Comcare and so on, there's another 20% on top of this increase in the salaries of the workers. So we will continue to do this. NWC is working now. They are meeting. I'm sure that they will pay close attention to this issue. I will look forward to their recommendations, which I hope will be published within this month. This is the way we can build an inclusive society and share the fruits of growth with every Singaporean. We must make sure by keeping Singapore open, by keeping our economy growing, by sharing the fruits of growth with all our workers. 
that Singapore remains successful, prosperous, the place to be. Looking to the future, not back to the past. Commanding a premium, not offering a discount. The first choice for investments and talent, not a place which is bypassed and neglected, where things get done cheaper, better, and faster. So we are ahead of many other countries. Let's maintain this lead, make the right moves, and make sure that we and our children enjoy better jobs, better pay, and better lives for many more May Days to come. Happy May Day. Thank you.